Lord, we thank you so much for the beautiful day. We thank you for this fellowship tonight. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house with the presence of the Holy Spirit here. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. And we ask that your will be done in each of our hearts this evening. May we hear the word and apply it to our lives. And may we worship in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's welcome in the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power.
Yeah. Uh-huh.
holding a meeting, and it said that his mother and his brethren were outside. This was after they had a meeting to determine that they thought he was beside himself. You know, Jesus not went crazy. He went into the temple and turned over all the tables, and he ran out all the traitors and everybody. And so they were kind of concerned about him, and it talks about his mother and his brother being outside. They come to the meeting to talk to him. So I understand from that point that James, even as his other brothers and his mom, they were at one time really concerned about the, the conduct of Jesus. You know, one of the things history has taught us in Jewish history, they say that James was a man who was unusually a good man. You know, that's one of the things they said about him, and that he was surnamed the Just is what they called him in. And not only that, but his countrymen, according to Jewish history, would say that he was a good and a just man. Well, you know, it said that James was a man who spent so much time in prayer and on his knees, so he would be very befitting to be the one to write the writings that he wrote here, that he spent so much time on his knees that they called him camel knees. They said that his knees were as the knees of camels. And you know, even in his death, James was still praying for the ones who were, were slaughtering him, who were killing him. Because even in his death, what they did to James was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and this group of elite religious people, they took him up into the temple and they took him up in a window and they told him he had to denounce the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does James do? James says that Jesus is Lord and he's the soon to come king. So they threw him out of the window down to the ground. And when James hit the ground, he kneeled and he just prayed. And the Bible says that they, not the Bible, but the Jewish history says that they begin to stone him. And as they were stoning him to death, it says that James was there praying, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Until one one of the, the men actually walked over with a blunt object and hit him in the head and finally ended his life. So it's only befitting that James would talk about the fiery trials that we might go through. And even in that, that we should have joy in that, in that time, that when we fall into these diverse temptations, we have to understand that these are building blocks in our life. As I was saying this morning with, with uh, Jacob, Jacob was strengthened in what he was doing and, and how Jacob held on to, held on to God as he wrestled with God and God had to pierce him in the side to make him let go. And if you think about it, you know, the things that we go through, and as I was saying this morning, that we should have such a grip on God, you know, that, that we should say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And God always will. You know, once we go through a trial, we'll come out of it, you know, that much better. We not only come out of it that much better, but the Bible says to just have joy, James said, as you go through those Trials. You know what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7? He said that the trying of your faith is what? He says, being much more precious than gold that perish. He said, though it be tried with fire, that it might be found unto praise. So what he's saying here is that there is an excellent and a perfect opportunity for us to be in a position of praise when we're going through those trials when we're going through those temptations, when we're going through all of those attacks that the enemy try to put on us, or the enemy tries to attack our health, he tries to attack our family, our marriages, he tries to attack at any level that he can. So we should just count it all joy. The fear that you should have is if the enemy ever just leaves you alone, he's never bothering you. Because then you have to, you have to think that you must be not doing what God wants you to do, or you... You're either in his way or you're out of his way, in other words. So the Bible talks about here, he says, knowing in verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. If you look at that word worketh in the Greek, it means that it employs. You know what employs means. That means it gives a job to your patience. And what is patience? Patience is our ability to be able to wait on God. And when we're in a position where we're going through or whatever we're going through, the thing that we shouldn't do is give up. We should have patience. We should wait. Now, I 
would recommend anybody in here pray to God that they should have patience because what employs patience? Pride. If you want to go through a lot, you ask God, God, I need patience. And see, what we need to understand is there's a difference between patience and long-suffering. So you might, you might ask God, well, God, give me long-suffering. Patience is the ability that you will have to be able to wait on God to fulfill his promise or to do what you've asked him to do. But long-suffering is giving us the ability to be able to deal with people. There's the difference. So if you can pray and say, God, you know, give me, give me long suffering, and I would say that, you know, I'm not trying too much to pray for long suffering because I don't want people troubling me that much either. <laughs> but the trying of your faith is what employs patience. And patience works you to maturity. That's where maturity comes from. Why? Because in patience, what do you do? The Bible talks about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Well, you know, if you go into any restaurant, you see a waiter. You, the waiter is not just sitting there, but the waiter is actually doing something while, while she's employed or while she's working. They that wait, that means that you have a responsibility to continue to do something even when you're going through that trial or you're going through that test. We still have to pray. We still have to get into our word and read our word. And, and why is that? Because that patience is going to bring maturity. It's going to put us in the word. You know, if you have to say, God, I'm seeking a word, because everything that, or every question that we have in our life, God has provided an answer in here. We just have to get in here, and we have to find it for ourselves. And one of the things my grandfather always told me, and my grandfather uh, preached for many, 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 many years. One of the, probably the wisest people that I knew, he could barely read, but he knew the word, and he loved God, and he passed on to me even this, this, this Bible cover that he preached out of. I mean, it's, it's all torn and everything, but one of the things that Grandpa would always tell me, he said, son, even if you're in church, he said, you don't never just gobble down everything that anybody tells you, because the devil go to church too, believe it or not. I mean, and that's one of the places that he want to be where he can stir up the most stuff. And my grandfather would tell you that because he, he lost a job one time at, a, at one of his churches because one of the prominent people started a movement against him because he was living with a woman that he wasn't married to and he preached against that so it was time for him to go. But Grandpa said you always get in the Word and you test every word. Don't just take my word for what, what the Bible says. Get in the Bible for yourself and know that that what anybody is sharing with you, that it is in fact the truth, because that's what's going to build maturity. So if you think about it, trial is going to employ patience. Patience in the time of suffering, that's the ability to be able to wait calmly. Ain't that, ain't that hard? I mean, it's almost impossible when you're going through a trial to just be calm or to just be still or not to want to not to want to pull your hair out sometimes because of some of the things that you're going through. But God wants us to wait calmly in joy for that glad day when God's going to move. You know, like I said, a day to God is as a thousand years, the Bible says. Sometimes, you know, we're in a hurry and we want God to move immediately. And God's saying, no, I need a little bit more refinement to happen in your life. And that's what he's doing. He's refining it. Because the longer you stay in that fire and you're in that gold that God is making, guess what? The purer you get. And that's what he's looking for. When he comes back, he's coming back for that church that's pure, that church that's, that's white. So think about it. Patience is going to work perfection. It's going to work maturity. And what is that? That is the ultimate goal. That's what we want. That's where we want to get to. That's the level we want to get to. And that's what Jesus walked in. And Jesus walked in so much authority that even the elements and everything else would obey him. And you might say, well, that was Jesus that did that. Yeah, that was Jesus that did that. But what limitations do we have with him on the inside of us still able to do the work that he did even in those days? That's why the Bible says that the works that I do, Jesus says this. He says that you will do and greater works because he goes to the Father. Why? Because Jesus was only in one place at one time. But the church is all over the world doing things on the ability to do greater works. But 
But my only qualm with the church is that a lot of times, um, and, and I go to I go to churches all the time and I meet people, a lot of times people struggle to grow in God. They struggle to grow up. You know, you have a lot of babies, and, and what you find is when you have a lot of young babies that are in the church or people who are not growing up, usually you're going to find that those are the ones that cause the most problems because they don't want to grow up. You know, it would be, you know, if we look at people and, and, and we would see like a 35-year-old still acting like a 10-year-old, we would say, well, something happened or something wrong with that individual. And it's the same way in Christ. I mean, the Bible says that we're going to go through trials, but the Bible also tells us to have patience, to wait on God. And it tells us that our patience is going to employ, um, that our trials are going to employ patience and that patience is going to bring us to perfection and maturity. It says, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect. Mature is the word that's used there in the Greek, that you may be mature or that you may be perfect and entire. How many people want to be entire? I want to be entire. I want to walk above the elements. I want to walk in hell. I want to be able to look at the devil and say and recognize him and say, oh, that's just the devil. Get out of the way. Because the Bible says that we have that ability. Yeah. We do. Yeah. It says here that you may be perfect and entire. And I love the last part. How many of this have you got here? Wanting nothing. <laughs> How in the world can you go through a fiery trial and be in a bad situation and then want nothing? It's almost impossible, isn't it? Just seems impossible. And James, who was one who went through all the things that he went through with the Judean church and with the Jews, James was able to tell them, hey, when you go through all of this, you're going to be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. You know, even Paul, he was in a place, even when he was in prison, and Paul was talking about how he fought the good fight of faith. And he could say all of these things, even being in prison, knowing what his faith was, Paul still had the joy of the Lord. Well, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So what is it that, that patience is going to bring us? Probably the biggest thing, and it talks about if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask it of the Lord, who gives it liberally and upbraideth not. So he's saying now that patience is going to bring you wisdom. That's what we all should be after. That's the very thing that Solomon asked for. And God said, because you didn't ask for the heads of your enemies and everything else, but you asked for wisdom. He said, I'm going to give you all of these other things. So there's the power that's in this context. Your trials are going to bring patience. Patience is going to bring perfection and maturity. Perfection and maturity brings wisdom. Wisdom. And why do we need wisdom? Because wisdom is going to help us in our ability in dealing with people, dealing with situations, and it's also going to give us a, a, or put us in a position, put us in a place where we're able to help others who are going through similar things that we've already come out of. And you can say that we can be like the three Hebrew boys who, whom, were, whom were thrown into the fiery furnace. And the men that threw them into the furnace were consumed, but they were in there dancing. And when they looked in, they said, did you not put three men in there? And there's four in that furnace now. That tells us that whatever we go through, wherever we are, God goes through it with us. He's always there with us. And when he said he'll never leave us or never forsake us, he meant that. He meant it. So even in your most trying hour, and even Jesus, who went through his most trying hour, when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he asked his disciples to carry with me for one hour. And can you imagine the ones whom he had walked with in full ministry for three years, whom he asked them, you know, I'm getting ready to go through a situation now where I need you guys to pray with me, to be with me. And what do they do? See, sometimes there's some trials and some things that you're going to have to go through by yourself because everybody that you have depended on in the past and trusted in the past may not become trustworthy at that hour or at that time. And Jesus, who was in the garden, the Bible says that he prayed so intensely that his sweat was as great drops of blood falling to the ground. Can you think about the agony that he was going through and nobody was there to go through it with him? They were sleeping. 
He went over and he woke him up. He said, can you not just tarry with me for, for an hour? He went and woke him up again, and finally he just said, sleep on. Because he knew he was going to have to go through this himself. And sometimes, you know, people may look at us and they may think that we have everything all together. And it may not even be the case. The case may just be that we're just counting it joy that we're going through that situation. And that situation, knowing that the end of that is going to bring us to a place where we're perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Patience brings wisdom. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that wisdom is the beginning of all understanding. That's why Jesus told them when he would share parables with them, and he told them the parable of the sword and how the word of God works. And he told them that if you understand this one parable, then you'll understand all things. Why? Because he defined to them exactly how the word of God works. It falls on good soil, rocky soil, stony soil. It falls on all of these types of soil. And that helps you to understand why different people get different results when they hear the word of God. Some people hear the word of God, they can run. They get everything that they need from it. Some people hear the word of God, and the, and the Bible says that the enemy comes immediately when they hear the word and snatches it away. And there's no fruitful life in them, is what it says. So the end game is for us to have wisdom that's employing what? Faith. He went from, he went from patience he went to wisdom, and then in the end, he said the end game was what? Faith. Why? He talked about a double-minded man not being able to receive anything that comes of God because it's valuable for us in our wisdom and in all of our getting, you know, to get wisdom. But wisdom is what's going to employ our faith, but it comes from us being able to be patient. See, prayer will help us to attain this wisdom and then comes that unwavering faith that we're able to stand undisturbed in the storms of life because we're going to have to go through them. All of us are going to go through something. And there's going to be tragic situations. There's going to be hard situations. And, and sometimes there's going to be situations you're going to have to go through all by yourself. Nobody around you will be able to understand what you're going through or why you're going through what you're going through. But God is refining us. And God's making us into what he wants us to be. And prayer is the very thing that does what? You get in the word and you begin to pray, now you're going to get to the level where you have what's called prevailing faith. How many of us want our faith to be able to prevail? See, when we pray, we want that expected result. In Mark, 20, in Mark 9 and 23, it says, all things are possible to him that believes. You just have to believe. And sometimes believing is the hardest thing to do. Especially if you're looking at the situation and the circumstances and everything that's around you. So we have to get in the word. We have to be in prayer. And then we're going to have that prevailing faith where we can speak to the elements. We can speak to the situation. And we can expect the, the God to be speaking on our behalf. And we can expect that in result. You know, if one person has genuine faith, they're going to have patience. You find me a patient person or a person that's real patient, I guarantee you, you're going to find a person that's got a lot of faith. Because you have to have it. Because that's the end game. In the beginning, it starts here with, uh, with your trials, working that, that patience. And patience turns all the way into you have to have faith. So if any man asks, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. He says, for he that wavers is like a, a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. That's not somebody I want to be in, in agreement with. If I want somebody to agree with me in prayer, I'm going to find that brother that's patient or that sister that's patient, that sister that has that faith that's unwavering, and we can unite our faith together and we can get through a situation. So if you have that genuine faith, the result will be patience. So let's think about it. And I just want to recap. And there's five things here that James gave us, five nuggets, five valuable jewels that he gave us that our trials will employ patience. Patience will bring us to 
perfection. Perfection is going to bring us prayerfulness, and the prayerfulness is going to bring us promotion, and the end game is spiritual maturity. Five things. Patience, perfection, prayerfulness, promotion, and spiritual maturity. That's what we're after. That's the end game. See, if we can all get to that level of, of maturity, there ain't no telling what believers can do in the earth. And we just have to come together. We just have to believe, just like they did on the day of Pentecost when they came together and the Holy Spirit came down. And all these souls heard people speaking in their native language and people were saved all over the place because they were united and they were there in one person. You know, God, the Bible says that he told above 500 to go in the carry. Only 120 showed up. So if you think about it, sometimes, you know, it, just because you see the, the big crowd and everybody's fired up and everybody's all for it, that don't mean everybody's going to show up for you. But the double-minded man receives nothing from God. A double-minded man will produce a double life. Let me say a double life, because a lot of times they'll try to look like in church that there's somebody that they're, that they're not. You know, they'll try to look around people, and they'll try to put themselves in a position where they look like, you know, they, they really got it all together, but inside everything's broken down, and it's, and it's all apart, because they're double-minded, they waver. They can say, they can pray here, but there's no, there's no effectiveness, there's no... Um, there's no results to that prayer because they're double-minded. So they can be at home worrying at the same time that we think that, hey, man, they got it, they got it all together. They can be at home in fear. They can be at home in doubt. And we can think that they got it all together. And, and I never take for granted that anybody, you know, has it just 100% all together because we all have our own things that we deal with and issues that we go through. But the thing is, is that we shouldn't be stagnant there. We should still be moving forward in God. And I, I can tell you this from experience. God does not like non-progressive people. God likes progression. God wants you to move forward. God wants you to grow. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't like people that doesn't, don't progress in him. And Jesus is a perfect example of all of the maturity in God. You know, we say, well, we can't, we can't live that life that, that Jesus lived. Have you tried? <laughs> Have anybody really tried to live the life that Jesus lived? But, I, but what I want you to take from this, if you take nothing else from this, is that trials, one, they're going to come. And those trials don't come just to annoy us or just to, just to be in our way or whatever. But those trials come because God wants to refine us. And God wants to make us into the person that he wants us to be. Now, we can go the long route if we want to. And, I'm, and, and I went the long route on some situations and some things myself and got in the way and got ahead of God and didn't get the result that I was looking for. And then I'm like, God, well, what happened here? God said, well, you got ahead of me. And one thing you'll, you'll figure out real quick is you can't outrun God. You, I don't care how far you get out there in front of him, you can't outrun him, but you can get ahead of what he wants you to do. So if you take nothing else from this, you know, let's be patient in our time of trial. And let's realize that even in that time of trial or whatever we may be going through, I know that you guys are looking to, to have a pastor, but patience is the, is, is the key, you know. We can, we can make not so good decisions sometimes when we get in a hurry about things. And God, you know, like I said, a day is a thousand years to God. I know we get in a hurry. We want, we want everything instant. We live in an instant society. When we order stuff from Amazon, we want it there on our front porch in a day. <laughs> you know, it's an instant society that we live in. But, but sometimes we have to, when we're going through that refining process, when we're going through the things that, that God is allowing us to go through, and I ain't saying God put everything on you, but God will allow us to go through things to build our character, to build us into the person that he wants us to be. And, 
No, and, and one of the things I was, well, God, you know, you make excuses. God, I don't even really, really like people. <laughs> you don't have to help me like people. <laughs> and then, like I said, when God did, I, I finally gave in to, okay, God, I'm a preacher. You got to you gotta do it. Preach my first sermon. I can remember. In, uh, 1993, that June of 93. In 20 minutes, I preached everything that I knew. I mean, I went from Genesis to Revelation, everything that I knew, and, and then didn't know how to end it or how to get out of it. Well, I'm done. <laughs> so I can close the Bible, and I'm going to go sit down. And God has asked me to do some things, and I may have shared with you before when I had trained at Trinity College in San Diego, and I can remember I had been out there, and that time difference was just was hard to me coming back. So I was like, I'm going to preach on this because this is a good thing. And when you get on there, before we take off, the title says, prepare yourself for a bumpy ride. So we got to go through two weather fronts to get to St. Louis. So it's going to get a little bit bumpy. You're going to have to remain in your seat. So as we can, we'll let them be able to serve you. You know, I thought to myself, I ain't going to get any sleep anyway. So I, But I tried. You know, so I'm sitting there, and I'm sleeping, and the ride just got bumpy. I mean, it felt like a plane was just dropping 100 feet every time we hit something, and I was like, this guy hitting every pothole in the sky that he could find up here. And that plane, I mean, it was suddenly dropping. Now, I can't get no sleep, so I'm going to pray, you know. I'm going to get the angel to take charge over this plane, and, and we're going to we're gonna get a smooth ride and smooth sailing, and I'm going to use my faith to fix that. But it didn't. So as I was praying, God began to mess with me. And this lady that's sitting here beside me, and I'm like, okay, uh, and God's sitting there talking to me. He said, I want you to tell this lady that she's going to live and not die. What? <laughs> is this really God? I don't know if this is this is God or not. The lady's just sitting there, and, and believe it or not, she was more calm than anybody else that was on the plane. And so I'm like, nah, I ain't doing that. I mean, if you don't tell somebody something like that, you know, come on. That might just be you know, my mind or flesh or something else is just talking to me because I'm disturbed and I'm praying on the plane. But I, I tried to go to sleep, couldn't go to sleep, and it was just like it was ringing. I want you to tell her that she will live and that she won't die. And I said, well, I'm going to have to do this because I'm not going to get any rest the whole time that I'm on this plane. So I, I tapped the lady and said, hey, how you doing? You know, and and uh, I said, God told me to tell you that you're going to live and not die. And that lady looked at me, and I mean, all of her wisdom just poured out of her eyes. And she began to tell me that she had cancer, and she was flying to St. Louis to, to say whatever her goodbyes or whatever she had to say to her parents and tell them that she had cancer, and she was scared, and she felt like she was going to lose her life as a result of it. She said, I was, I went to church when I was young and I fell away from God. And she said, I just felt like I couldn't just come back to God or anything because I let him, I let him down. And I told her, I said, you know, I said, God will always meet us, you know, where we are. And at any time, all you have to do is say, God, you know, come back into my life. And I mean, that lady sit there and she cried and and cried and I, the plane began to have peace after this. I kind of felt like Jonah, you know, everybody wants to throw me overboard. Maybe it was because I was being rebellious on the plane. And when we and when we landed, she asked me, I mean, she was still just kind of bawling and everything. And everybody's just looking at us because this lady's sitting by me and she's crying, you know, and 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 she said, I hug you. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people looking at me, and this lady crying. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, these people are going to think I did something to them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, I hugged her, and I told her, I said, God bless you. I said, I said, I sit here and wrestle with that to tell you that. And I don't even know you or know nothing about you. And I told you that. So I know that, that God will use us. You know, but we have to put ourselves in a position where God will use us. And, and the thing is, when God does speak to us, you know, and I figured out a long time ago from that, that, you know, I'd rather be found missing God, thinking or knowing that it's God, than to disobey God and miss him altogether. So that's our end game, and that's that decision, and that's what God wants us to do. Hallelujah. And if there's any.
I can fix it.